Washington needs some big time showings in November. You are Locked On Huskies, your daily podcast on the Washington Huskies, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back in to another edition of the Locked On Huskies podcast. I'm Roman Tomashoff. That's Lars Hansen. He's site editor with Athon Sports is inside the Huskies. I'm the site editor with Huskies Wire. Thank you for making this your first watch or first listen today as we are part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Lockdown College for $20 off your first purchase. Lars has got a really fun show coming out all the everyday today. We're going to get into some recruiting on this show. A couple interesting offers went out. There's a visit coming down the pipeline for the USC game this weekend, an official visit that is. We'll get into all that. We're talking about establishing the run and how crucial that's going to be over the final month of the season. But you and I are going to have a little fun. We're going to go back and forth draft style, you know, if you, if you want to call it that. Drafting three players each as to who the most important players are going to be for, for this Husky team in the month of November for one reason or another. So I'm going to hand it off to you. Who do you want to go with first? I'll take the handoff from Will Rogers and run with Jonah Coleman. Like oh, that okay. is the guy where, you know, no pun intended, but that was just a perfect setup where it's like that that's what needs to happen. And I know yeah. we'll talk about that more in, in the second segment, but it does kind of lead into where this offense goes with Jonah. Like Will can eat, Will's fine. Will's not whether it's Demon or Will. Like Demon just creates an extra gap. That's really the only thing Demon. No offense to Demon, but that's really all Demon does when he comes in the game. Jen said that verbatim a couple of weeks ago. Jonah is everything with his team. Jonah can do a lot on his own in terms of, you know, break con break tackles and things like that. But really it's just knowing that you have a guy like Jonah should get you at least 14 to 17 points a game, like two touchdowns and then maybe get you a field goal and a couple big runs, just him alone. But yet we're talking about finishing games where Washington's at 10, 17, you know, 21, maybe. And it's like, there seems to be so much left on the bone. And so Jonah's got the meat. He's just got to be given the ball. Speaking of running the ball, Lars, one guy that I really want to talk about is Kaylee Tafai, where I'm really interested to see how this left tackle position is going to shape up, especially because Jed Fish and Brennan Carroll both basically already ruled Maximus McCree out for this week against USC. So I'm really curious to see what that looks like where it's, you know, it sounds like Sawana Fasolo and Kelly Tafai are going to split reps where you pointed out the other day, Kelly Tafai was the highest graded pass protector for Washington uh, against Indiana. And he was really solid. Like, it, you know, it wasn't like it was a, a low grade or anything. He had a really solid performance on, what was it, 29, 30 snaps, something like that. So I really want to see him get more snaps moving forward. And another interesting thing to note, because in his first, you know, significant college action, he was also the catalyst, or I don't want to say that he was the only catalyst, but he was one of the, the key players on both touchdown drives for Washington, where both touchdowns are scored against Indiana. Kaylee Tupai was at left tackle. You go back and you watch that 46-yard run that Jonah Coleman ripped off. Who is it right there making a key block? It's Kaylee Tupai. So that's another guy that I'm really curious when you look at the offensive line, how it might shape up, where Jed said, you know, a couple of guys are a little banged up. We'll see what it looks like moving forward. That's one guy who can make a really, really big impact down the stretch. Yeah, same thing with the Iowa game when he came in and I think that was yeah. the first scoring drive as well. And so it's just like, and it, it, we're not talking down to other players, but it's just more or less like it just is what it is. And in that same mold, I'm going to, well, you know. Sorry, no, no, it's, it's, I, I just want to, uh, you know, elaborate on one thing you said there because I agree. It's, it's not necessarily, you know, that we're trying to knock anybody else's performance. The cream will always rise to the top. And that's what you want. You want this competition for the best player to win out. And if, if that's Kaylee Jafari, that's awesome. Sorry, go ahead. Who's your next guy? You know, no, exactly. I, mean, I think that kind of goes hand in hand what we're saying on defense. And for me, it's going to be Alfonso Tupatala, where I got, talk about guys yeah. that cream that rises to the top. We're talking about yeah. the top, where, and this is not, Important is like, hey, you know, he hasn't been playing well, yada, 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 like we we're talking about with the offensive line. It's no, talk about one of your, the heartbeat of your defense. Jonah and, and Alfonso kind of go hand in hand with that. You're talking about USC, especially specifically this week, where you got Miller Moss, he's a very good passer in his own right. Woody Marks is a good uh, running back. You know, so you're, you're, you're going to have, and then go to Penn State, you talk about Oregon, all these matchups coming down the stretch. You have to have the heartbeat of your defense be in lockstep, and that's no, no it's no knock to Carson because we both love Carson. But it just Absolutely. seems like as this season has gone along, Alfonso has been the X factor, and I don't, I feel like I almost said that before the season at some point. We're like not as like a X factor, like a hidden X factor, like hey, like this defense is going to go with Alfonso, the offense goes with Jonah, same sound, same kind of thing. You're absolutely right. Where. Alfonso has been the X factor because of his ability to line up all over the formation where Carson has still been, you know, exactly what we thought he'd be. He's still leading the team in tackles. Like he's still been an 
excellent player for this defense all season long. So I like where you're going with that. I'm going to stick on the defensive side for my next one. And I want to talk about that. He's Dixon where we got to talk to him a little bit on Tuesday. He talked about, you know, his journey from junior college to D1 and the improvements he's made under John Richardson. He talked about his discipline, his technique, how much he's been able to improve with John Richardson there as the cornerbacks coach now. So that's all really nice to see. But Lars, one interesting little note here in the final month of the season, Washington, the secondary that leads the nation right now, still leads the nation with 123.1 passing yards per game allowed. They are going to be facing four of the top eight passing offenses. And this is after facing Indiana. Yes, with the backup quarterback, but they still did a really good job against a talented receiving core and held David Jackson to only 124 rushing or excuse me, passing yards. The rushing defense, different story. Need to improve there. But you look at the secondary and it's been really solid. Price stock's been awesome. And Daddy Dixon on the other side has been a lockdown corner. And with some of the receiving cores that you're going to be facing over the final month of the season, you don't just need one corner. You need at least two. And Thaddeus Dixon has proven to be that guy this year. Absolutely. I mean, you mentioned the Indiana game because I, I, ironically, I'm looking at the TFF numbers right now. Four targets, one catch. How many total yards do you think he gave up? Oh, I, I know this. It was like three yards. Two. Ah, no, but, but, but no, exactly. No, that's, not, yeah. that's, that's, that's the, now again. Is, is Indiana USC? But also, no, USC is not USC. Actually, Indiana, like we said, going into that week, they might not have like a 1A, like a Denzel Boston or a, you know, a Mecca or whatever, but they have a lot Elijah of guys. Elijah played of, like one though. But no, exactly. And that's kind of what ended up not lead, directly leading to that win, but it seemed like, hey, like you're, if you're going to let a team end up developing a 1A against you, you're going to have some problems. And so that almost to me, I was, I'm curious, speaking of the cornerback thing, do you end up flip this dad become that maybe 1A where it's like, hey, this guy's having a good game or, you know, because again, they're so they're two good, really good cornerbacks is what I'm saying. And so it's like, I'm curious sure. to see like, how do you improve as you're facing more passing defenses? We haven't seen that as much this season. I, I don't think it's necessarily going to be a, a one or the other in that scenario. Cause I get what you're saying and I, I don't disagree with it, but it's not like a, Oh, you know, for example, Zachariah branch this week, it's not, Oh, Thad is going to now go with Zachariah branch. It's knowing you can have that on both sides of the field. You don't need necessarily somebody to travel where all of a sudden when you have two guys like that, it's okay. We know we can trust guys on both sides of the field. However, the offense wants to align to counter that. Let's see it. Let's make it happen. Lars, who's your last guy here? No, I'm glad. I just wanted you to let not need to be told that, but it's just like, Hey, let me just explain this. Throw it out into the ether. So that's what I want to do that for third guy. So I'm kind of torn on this. I don't know if I want to take the obvious or a guy who is just as important to the obvious. So I think that, let's go with the lesser, the lesser of the two there. Drew has a party. So I, I like you mentioned this. Kaylee Safai for the exact same reason. The tackles have been where Washington struggled this season. Like let's just flat out say what it is. And when you look at PFF's pre- total pressure for the season, it goes as the party, Sawane, cut the list in half. Max McCree and Kaylee Safai, I think are somewhere in the seven, eight, nine. 10, 11 mold somewhere in there, but the other two are drastically higher. And so whoever is playing left tackle, is never playing right tackle. Like that's where a lot of the pressure is coming from. So if Will has time to develop, if Jonah can run off tackle and set and run against the edge and not just have to run in between the tackles or have to straight up, like we saw against Indiana, bounce it all the way outside. Cause that takes right. two, three, four more seconds. It's like a longer developing route. Do you take a quick slant where you can just r- run a handoff and dives inside, you create the opening and where you, kind of make a cut outside and it's a lot quicker in one fluid motion, or is this a long developing play action route where you got to really, you know, one, two, three, because by the time Jonah gets outside, as much as we love him, teams and especially good teams, like they're going to face in December in November are going to be able to track him down against Eastern Michigan and Weaver state. No, no strays getting shot there. Just being honest here, like you can do that. But as we've seen in the big 10, you know, Jonah can do it, but then he's taking so much of a beating and he's also holding up a passport. Like that's, kind of why Jonah needed that yeah. time off was it wasn't just the running. It was like it's your best pass blocker. Dude's getting abused here. Like, so I, I, no, I'm glad you mentioned that. Cause speaking of pass blocker, one guy that I, I want to mention is just improved all around as a blocker and also turned into a really nice receiving threat this year. That's Kaleki Law too. Where that's the last guy I want to go with here, where I remember I, I asked him at the press conference on Tuesday, I said, do you still feel like, you know, wh- where do you feel you want to improve most the final month of the year? And he was very quick to be like, yeah, I, I want to get better at running after the catch. Where that guy's 6'7", 235, 240. Our buddy Scott Eklund walks walks by right after and just goes, man, he's he's just absolutely massive. And yeah, absolutely. And looking at that that play that he had 
in the fourth quarter where he drags a couple defenders inside the the five ten yard line. He highlights that and says, "Yeah, I I know I can do that. I want to be able to do that more." And that's something that I'm really looking at because with this receiving core, you want to make sure you have as many options as possible. And a guy like Latu that can be a mismatch like that. That could be huge. Now, Lars, we started with Jonah Coleman. Let's get back to that. Let's talk about establishing the run in the last month. We'll get there right after the message from our good friends over at Game Time, because Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets to see your favorite teams play live even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats. You don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets, which is great news if you want to check out one of the final two Husky football games of the year. You can find those tickets, Husky basketball tickets, Seahawks tickets, Kraken tickets, you know, any concerts, any shows in the area you want to go see. All of them and so much more is over on Game Time, because with Game Time Picks, curation makes it easier to save so much more on sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. With their all-in pricing, you can toggle this feature and it shows the total upfront with no surprise fees at checkout. And with game time ticket coverage, your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. You can take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time picks, download the game time app, create an account, and use code Lockdown College for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-C-O-L-L-E-G-E for $20 off. Download game time today. What time is it? Game time. So Lars, we wanted to dive into establishing the run, which after Jonah Coleman got his most carries of the season, he got 19 against Indiana. We really loved seeing that. And they're going to face some pretty tough run defense over the final month, Penn State and Oregon being the two toughest ones. But we look at this, the schedule in this, this final month, Washington has a chance to be bowl eligible. It's not necessarily where we thought this team would be at the beginning of the season having to fight for that, but that's where they are. That's the reality of the situation. And when we look at this, We've seen the Huskies struggle to score points in the red zone. We've seen them struggle to move the chains on third down. And a lot of that can be mitigated by establishing the run with one of the best running backs in the country. There's there's so many numbers that you can dive into this with. And the one that I really wanted to point out is you look at missed tackles where it was cut down to just missed tackles in the uh, power four games for 20 carries, or excuse me, versus FBS opponents. Jonah Coleman is averaging 6.9 missed, uh, broken or missed tackles per 20 carries this season against FBS opponents. That's how good this guy is. We love watching him. He's been so much fun to watch all season long. And the usage has been, you know, it's been what it is. But in the final month, it looks like Jed Fish is showing that willingness, willingness and showing that commitment to running the ball with him. And that's going to be really important down the stretch. If I told you, if I asked you to choose who has more carries of 10 plus yards after contact, Jonah Coleman or Ashton Genty, who are you going with? Uh, just because I, I know that he leads the nation in like 10 plus yards, 10 plus, uh, rush rushes. I'd go with Jonah Coleman, but I know it's yep. close. Yeah. So it's by one. The Jonah has yeah. 30 and, and Ashton has 29. And so that to me, and you know, you, cause you mentioned diving into the numbers, there's so many that you can dissect. So here's, what's crazy is Jonah to, in total, I think he's 28th among running backs in the country on PFF, just for a running gray overall, but he's still seventh in yards after contact. So what does that tell you automatically? It tells you Jonah's having to carry more of the burden, no pun intended, than the holes are being open for him. And yes, you played Iowa, decent, you know, pretty good run defense, Indiana, pretty good run defense, but it's not like it's all worldly. And the problem is it's when you end up having to use Jonah to get you to the 35 or the 20, and then have to use Jonah again to get you in the red zone. It's kind of like at well, some point, because again, like, look at who else has a rushing touchdown this season aside from now Giles after the so, Indiana game. It was just Giles. Probably. It was just. When, oh, and, and, I, and no, I, I, I agree. With you. Going into but, Indiana, it was just Jonah. That's no, but that, that's not what I'm saying though. Where I, I that's not what I take issue with. What I take issue with is this team has three really talented running backs. Uh, with you know, you, you consider Cam Davis, you consider Adam Muhammad. Well, that was a big reason that we wanted to talk about this. It goes beyond Jonah. It's all three of those guys. And when we talk about establishing the run, again, it goes beyond that. When I look at this rushing attack, it's, you know, we saw Adam Muhammad be able to pick up a whole bunch of yards after contact and break tackles. We've seen Cam Davis do it. I know it's not the run game, but we've seen him do it in the screen game as well, where we've seen all three of these guys be really, really effective. But it just felt like the the establishing the run factor has not been there in the way that we might have expected with what this trio of running backs is. And maybe part of that's on the offensive line, not being, you know, everything that it, it probably can be and might be in the future. 
but it just feels like that you can do a whole lot more by attempting to establish the run with all three of these guys. Exactly. Well, and that's the other thing is I, again, it kind of, in a way is getting back to the, you know, ties in with the quarterback thing. Okay. Well, you're trying to bring along Demon while still using will at running back. It's, you know, you have Jonah, the guy you brought in with your system, but you still want to respect Cam Davis because he's a senior. He's been in the program a lot and he's actually played pretty well this season, you know, when called, but it hasn't, been, but not as much as Jonah, not as consistent as Jonah. Like sometimes, you know, Cam is like, you know, six for 19. And then he's got a game where it's, you know, three for 45, where it, it just, for whatever reason. And, you know, sometimes it's also been a good pass catcher too. So it's kind of what they're asking of the running yeah. backs. And then you're talking about Sam Adams has got some carries, Daniel and got him. And so is it almost like you're trying to mix in too many guys? Cause it really seems like it's still Jonah, well, Sam, or Jonah, Cam and Adam. So Jonah Coleman has by far the most carries on this team with 118. Obviously, so Cam Davis is second. How many carries do you would you guess that he has right now? Cam Davis, 44. Yeah. 43. Nice. But that's I think that's more of the problem is when we you see Cam Davis out there more often than not now, it's gonna be okay when he's out there. You are you're almost gonna expect the pass if you're the defense. And you look at just where some with Jed's last stop at Arizona. You look at the way that Karras was split up there. Jonah still, you know, led the team last season, but I believe Michael Wiley was second and he had 76, 77. So it's it, they're on pace to lean more on Jonah, which rightfully so. He's earned it. He's absolutely earned it with his play. But at the same point, when you're rotating and you say, all right, we like all these guys. We want to make sure that all three of these guys get in there. And you're going to make it a little bit more obvious when Cam Davis is in there, especially that, okay, yeah, now we're going to throw the ball a little more often. It doesn't necessarily lend to what you want to do. And I just think that if you want to really go after it and establish the run and do what Jed Fish told us last week and say, hey, our identity going forward is we want to have a really good rushing attack. We want to play great defense and we want to be able to take shots down the field. But if you have this trio of running backs and you're only establishing the run with one of them, it doesn't necessarily lend to what you want to do. Yeah. And I think the, I mean, the problem that we kind of, not that we're beating around the bush or that we're hitting, because again, we've hit on it so many times, you know, time and time again. How far down the list do you think you have to go to find UW's first highest graded um, pass blocking offensive lineman? On I, I, I you, we talked about this yesterday. It's definitely pretty far down there. Yeah. So I'm trying to. Remember, so it's D'Angelo actually at 50, right on the money. But it's it kind of speaks to you know okay if your center is a good you know pass blocker, but that's fine. But if you're you know 50th in the country, everybody else is kind of you know even further and further down. And so for whatever reason, it's because, you know, with run blocking, it's, I've always thought, you know, I'm, I've never, again, never played the sport. Never obviously don't have the body of an offensive lineman here, but I've always kind of assumed it's like, you know, you want, you hear from offensive line, you would rather run block than pass block because you're moving downhill. Yeah. You're going up and getting yours versus going pass block. You know, if you're playing wide, if you're going into wide nine, you got to kick step twice as fast. And you know this two, you know six six two hundred twenty pound speed rusher is already going to probably be past you, and you know because you know that's how the game has evolved. So to me, it's like, what is the reason why Washington can't be physical? Because we look at this line; it's Landon, Guard, D'Angelo, e, you know, Enoch, Drew, and whether you, whether it's Max, Kali, or or Suana at left tackle, it's like you would think with the size that Washington has, it would be easier to impose their will. And sure. for whatever reason, they straight up have it. Like maybe they gassed themselves against Michigan, where that effort against Mason Graham was everything that you know this offensive line had. You know, it's like, hey, you did it, but now you so, kind of shot yourself. Through, which I'm not saying it's the case, but it's just no, like I, I know because since, since then we haven't really seen it. Yeah, Jonah got over 100 against Indiana, but then nobody really knows. Well, that's but that that's one thing that um I it just when you said that it kind of clicked in my head. It's what's the one thing that both these uh, these last two games have in common? Outside of both of them being on the road, they were both at 9 a.m. So it's one of those things where I'm really curious to see if that was an issue where Jed said it himself. Jed talked about it on Brock and Salk, I believe it was, after the, the Iowa game. He said, yeah, I didn't do the best job possible preparing our guys for Iowa. And we tried some different things for Indiana. And it showed they they looked more physical in the first half. And it looked like, the, you know, they, they weren't down, especially, you know, when the, the offense struggle in the second half that they, they didn't look the same, but we saw, especially Jonah, like he did get over hundred yards. As you said, he still had a really nice game, 
but it just, it feels like there's still, I don't want to say an extra gear, but there's still more to be desired in the run game, which again, is another reason we wanted to make sure we brought this up. And when I look at it, I just, I look at this trio of running backs and I, I see so much talent. I do. Where I think about it and I say, if Jonah comes back for his senior season next year and it's him and Adam Muhammad running the show, that's, that's going to be a really exciting duo to watch. And it's really fun to watch this year with another year, you know, for both of those guys, it'd be even more fun. But that's that, I think that's kind of the point that I'm trying to make here is there's still more to see from this ground game. And in the final month, I think they have a really good opportunity to show that. They do. It's just, it's again, it's why it's so aggravating for Husky fans. I have to imagine because it's like, well, why not do that right now? What's the difference right. between 12 months from now? And really actually Jed talked, the answer is Jed talked about it on Monday. It's getting another year to get stronger, having max for a full year versus max for three months, having these freshmen. Now you have a season of reps in there. You know, your redshirt freshmen are now actually game ready or, you know, game experience, not just sure. redshirt freshmen with no experience. And so, all of that lends to look. This was a bridge year, and, and bridges, and it's never fun driving over a bridge. Everyone always says, "Okay, like, hey, it's awesome to drive over a bridge until you drive over what's that one in uh, in Maryland or Baltimore where it's like you go. It's an East Coast bridge where you go. Up I know, and I know what you're down. talking about. Yeah, it, it, it's it's an insanely scary bridge, and it's one of those where it's like, yeah, everybody always says, "I want to go visit this bridge," and then you get to the bridge, and it's like, "Oh, hey, we'll cross that bridge when we get there." Nobody ever crosses the bridge willingly or or enjoyingly. It's, <laughs> you put it off for the last possible second. It's like. Yeah, so it's, it's that's why it's so frustrating. But to your point, sure. the back end of this next year is why we would say ten and two is in the cards because again, all the pieces are coming back. You add more from the portal. Why not, well, Lars? Twenty twenty five is a bridge we will cross when we get there. But we got to talk about that recruiting class. So Lars, there have been a couple interesting developments in terms of the twenty twenty five recruiting class. One of them is something we aren't shocked by, and that's that Kevin Cummings wants to add another wide receiver. And I, actually, I wouldn't say we're shocked by either of those things. But the first one is Kevin Cummings wants to add another wide receiver. Four-star Florida commit Nation Montgomery is taking an official visit this weekend to take in the USC game, which is really interesting. He's got a couple of trips lined up. I know he's going to Ole Miss the week after, and then it's Alabama after that on the 16th. So... He's looking around, really curious, and I know he said something, I believe it was to On3, saying that, yeah, Donovan Alubade told me I needed to get up there and check that out, so I wanted to see it for myself. So that's an interesting little tidbit. Let's start there, because, again, Kevin Cummings wants to take a wide receiver. I don't necessarily know if Nashon is the number one guy right now, just because of Andrew Marsh, who is, you know, we'll, we'll see what that looks like, especially with Michigan apparently making a push for Bryce Underwood interesting the LSU commit number one player in the class but let's see what that all looks like but I'm I'm just really curious to see how this this plays out with a little over a month till signing day I I just there's something there's something about Jed targeting a Florida commit this at this point in the process I don't know I I know I I respect the game I don't know but to me again sure. yeah that, like it's what we said over the summer where it's like look what did Jed say even back when he was at Arizona when he talked during the one of the last early signing classes it was you can never have too many good wide receivers like if, if you have an elite wide receiver or somebody who you like you know Donovan Alvarez you know the McMillans sure. of the world anybody that you can get like that's interested and that you can say like look this is he's gonna be a guy you don't have to necessarily develop him as much as some guy where it's hey he's got the body but you know we need to still kind of work on his you know route running x, x y and z sure. so these guys it's, then and that's what makes such a difference to the bridge where if you're bringing in high caliber four and five stars, you know what Georgia and Alabama and Missouri and Florida and, and Clemson used to do and all those sort of things. It's okay. That's how you build the product. And then you sprinkle in the transfers. Whereas, you know, like if you're looking next year for two or three years, you know, 25, 26 and 27, you're looking at DeMond and saying, you might have Dylan Robinson. You might have D uh, Donald Labote. You might have the receiver coming in this week. There's so many guys that you can say, Hey, you're not just having him for a year, like a one year, like a Jeremiah. You're having him, you're building that out. And then now you could, that's how you build out a program. And so everything that kind of Kalen took advantage of in the last couple of years to, you know, show, hey, this is what the back end of that development looks like. Sure. When everything clicks and works, but the build to get there might be aggravating. But this is why the build through high school is so important because you don't want to have to be going into the portal every single year and saying, oh, we need two receivers, probably two or three linemen, and then a couple of D tackles, right. maybe a linebacker, a starting safety, a starting cornerback. And it's like, 
How about develop some guys instead of right. you know refine the guys that already just maybe didn't get good coaching but have good ball skills, you know, already in college. I I, I think that's a fantastic point by you. Where the portal is certainly going to be useful, especially when you know the the biggest thing that I with this team, especially that I'm looking for in the transfer portal is an offensive lineman or two that are looking to make that power five jump where, you know, you can just, you can look around and say, oh, okay, yeah, this guy from like, I don't, I don't want to talk about Chris Adams necessarily, where I'm sure that that's still a sore spot because that was just an odd recruitment, but somebody in that mold of, okay, yeah, you know, he's either a, a G five guy or he's at an FCS school or something. And he's looking to make that FBS jump. That's one thing where I look at it for offensive linemen. I think that'll be really important. Maybe a defensive tackle this year would end up being a really nice difference maker with Sebastian Valdez being out of eligibility. We know Voight Tanoof is out of eligibility. So uh, Jacob, Jacob Bandis as well. So you're going to be looking for a guy in there as well, but we'll get to the portal. I just, I thought that was, it's th- that's a really great point that you made. I, when I look at this offer, I see, okay, you are really trying to build with a whole bunch of guys that you think can come in next year and produce and be a wide receiver three, maybe one of these guys like Chris Lawson will be the first one that comes to mind, right? And Vine Sprite as well, or a wide receiver four type guy where look at what Rasheed Williams is doing now where, you know, I look next year and I see, all right, I'm really curious with Denzel Boston probably coming back. We'll see what that looks like. And then Rasheed Williams and Keith Reynolds. And you can build from there, you know, Audrey Harris, Jason Robinson, the guys that are already here being in that mix, plus whatever you're going to get from this freshman class. So the Montgomery offer is really interesting in that case to see if it maybe puts pressure on Andrew Marsh saying, hey, we're looking to take a guy. We'd prefer if you were that guy, but we'll see how it works out. Not that I, I want to knock anybody else's talent in any way. That just with the relationship that they established with him really early on in the process, that's kind of where, when I look at Marsh, I say, this is where I, I think that it's going to happen. But Lars, the other guy I want to get to and the other position that we need to get to is I don't want to say cornerback. I don't want to say safety. I just want to say defensive back because that's when, uh, that's what Keyshawn Davila is. He's a defensive back and he plays at Northwest Mississippi. He's the number two rated uh, cornerback right now, which is really interesting because I actually had a source text me this morning I, and as soon as the offer went out, somebody who who works in recruiting is, is all I can say about this person. And they texted me and just said, that's a really good offer. I'm a huge fan of this guy's talent. And I thought that was really interesting. So we had a, a back and forth. We discussed the film a little bit where they told me, he said, yeah, you know, he's listed as a corner. A lot of schools like him at corner, but a lot of schools really like him at safety. And I'm really curious to see how this works out. He released the top seven you know, shortly before the offer, uh, Washington was not or shortly after the offer, excuse me, Washington wasn't in that top seven, but I look at this position and I say, okay, if Washington wants to take another safety, they've got a whole bunch of young guys in the room, but they might want to take a guy like this with junior college experience. You can play him right away alongside a Peyton Waters or Rashawn Clark, a Paul Menke, Raheem Wright, whoever it might be. But if you also want to take him at cornerback, I feel like you might be okay with that. There's Dylan Robinson, there's Darian Clemens, and there's Ramon Adams right now. But at the same point, when I look at his film, I see more of a safety because we hinted at it with the insiders. I, we won't get too much into that, but it seems like this this coaching staff is still pushing for a cornerback as well. Well, I mean, it's what John Richardson kind of said both in both in spring fall camp and kind of just throughout what his message has been is look like if we if you can play corner, you can play corner, but we kind of might need you to move around and do a few things like Ephesians Friday. Sure. No, Ephesians Friday. Like, Elijah Jackson is the perfect example of that, where 6'2", 6'3", cornerback, listed as a corner, but he's played safe to play Nick. But basically, basically, you were a defensive back. And it's kind of what you know DBU used to be, where it's, yeah, you had Buddha was a safety, but he was kind of just a dude. He was a dog. I mean, yeah, you know, he certainly played the safety position, no doubt, but he was like a honey badger in that respect, where it was, right. hey, I'm going to come up and be a blitzer. I'm going to do multiple different things, where if you have a 6'1", cornerback, well, it's kind of hard to do cornerback blitzes. Well, put him at safety, have him have the coverage skills. And let's say, you know, let's say you have an injury or whatever, and you need to shift some things around or do whatever. Having those versatile type guys, I think is what yeah. we're driving. At. I mean, where a guy who you don't, exactly that. you can pin him into a position if you want, but there's no reason to. And I think that's where John Richardson and kind of the whole triangle effect of the room works, where you have Vinny, you have John, and you have um, Armand Ochi Belichick. And, well, and, oh, and, and, and Armand Hawkins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Steve Belichick being kind of the guy in the circle, the triangle sure. within the circle. Sort of well, thing. just remember so, that Steve Belichick also did coach safety's first time with the Patriots, which is which is why I say that. Yeah, 
Yeah, I forgot about that. Then and Vinny also Vinny also coached running back, so you know. Yeah, he did. Scotty Graham goes to you know. Uh, anyways, I'm, 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 we're we're going down a rabbit hole here. But the point being, it's the versatility that Steve Belichick has kind of hinted at, where he said, and yeah, I remember he kind of I don't know if it was you asked the question. It probably was just knowing your background. But when he was like, you know, look, there's there's no leg for like comparisons. There's no Jabril Peppers to Cam, you know, for Vicky Alon or Cam Brassard. You know, there's sure. there's no like he he's never going to do that. But it, there is a there again. It's an appropriate question because look, like Steve has a scheme. Now, how do you correlate that between high school, college, and you know how do you recruit? You know what is because everything is a projection. Same thing in the NFL. It's like how does this guy project to this position? And we see in the right. NFL as years have gone on. Hey, he's a safety, but it's like a hybrid position. It's a hybrid linebacker. It's a hybrid defensive end. It's a hybrid whatever. It's like you're just looking for the best eleven. And so yeah. this is a guy when you look at the tape. He needs to be one of the 11. I think that's why Washington ends up jumping in the picture. Again, the curious thing is, yeah, how does this class round out? Because, again, there's going to be some attrition after the season. And you always – I do want to say this real quick. I love that the staff is still going after junior college guys. Like we've seen it with Thad. We've seen it with a handful of guys where it's like, look, yes, you could take the Jaden Waynes, the guys that have local ties, or, the, you know, the Hayden Moores in the Colorado West Coast region, you know, bring them back a little closer to home sort of thing. But Thad has shown, and as much as we love and hate, you know, love Thad, love the game, love the player, love the person, hate the, you know, sometimes way he goes over the line just because it's like, dude, you don't need to do that. Like, you don't need to. <laughs> you're He's done a much better is. job of that this year. I got to give him credit no, exactly. for that. Well, and that's where the coaching comes into play. So yeah. you can get the dog of the Juco and then pair that with great coaching, and that's why it works so well. Because yes. you can get Juco guys and then they can go off the rails if they don't have the right. Because that's, you know, this is not a shot at Juco here. I just think it's a fair assessment you're getting better coaching when you're going to these F power four schools. That's why you're going, but you're getting good coaching at Juco. Like, Hey, like this guy, he's a good dude. You can work with him better because again, your experience, John Richardson, et cetera, et cetera, same thing with Jimmy Lake. And so sure. this could be that similar path, which is always intriguing to see. Lars, as always, thank you so much for being here. Thank you all every day for tuning in. We really do appreciate your support. And thank you so much for making Lockdown Huskies your first listen today. Now for your second listen, check out the Lockdown Big Ten podcast. Our guy, Craig Sheeman, puts the Big Ten first. When everyone else overlooks it, you can find Lockdown Big Ten on YouTube or wherever else you listen to your podcast. And with that being said, please make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcast. So that's YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music. We're there. We're everywhere. We're updating this channel for new content every single day. So make sure you click that like button, click that little bell so you never miss when we post new video. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, up right down below in the comment section and if you're audio only please if it's five star reviews it does help us out a lot thank you so much for tuning in and we'll talk to you on thursday